Maniacs, this is Hulk Hogan, the greatest of all time, and you're listening to The Blaze. So what you going to do when Hulk Hogan in Blaze of Mania runs wild on you? You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio, featuring the interactive interview, courtesy of WrestlingEpicenter.com. Today we have far none our most prestigious interview ever. At this time, I'd like to welcome the face of professional well, the face of professional wrestling. Excuse me to our show, Mr. Hulk Hogan. Hulk, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. What's up, guys? How's everything going, brothers? I'd also like to welcome you to the program. I've been a Hulkamaniac for 20 years. You're the reason I got involved in this business, and I got to tell you, it's an absolute honor and privilege to speak with you. Hey, man, thank you so much. I just uh, appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to do a little venting here. A little hey. venting. Oh, what's on your mind? Uh, not much, man. Just the time of day, kids, daughter's getting old enough to date, and I'm mad about it. <laughs> well, enough. speaking of getting a uh, year older, not to put you down or anything, but tomorrow's your birthday, so let me be the first to wish you a happy birthday. Oh, thanks, brother. 52, what you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. Could that be a new t-shirt? Yeah, I probably should. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a bad idea. It might sell for a couple of days. <laughs> All right, well, of course, we've got to ask you about the biggest match in the history of professional wrestling, yourself against Andre. But we're going to give it a new spin instead of asking the same question that happened, you know, 18,000 times in every interview you've ever done. I'm just going to give you another uh, spin on it. You know, that match was pretty much a ground-based style. A lot of the guys in the business today are doing all these high-risk aerial moves, and quite frankly, they can't even draw half the crowd. So, you know, what is it so different about you, the way that you do things, that transcends what they do? Well, you know, I listen with my heart. I listen with my ears. And I really don't need to sit in the back and talk to someone about what we're going to do out there because there's no way you can call it right from the back seat. You have to be out there and listen to the fans first and then react on that. So it's kind of a, uh, a situation that it's instinct. And, you know, if I could drop kick and I could climb to the top of the cage and splash somebody from the top of the cage, believe me, I would pick the spot when it really meant something. And it's all about, you know, working hard out there and working smart. And, you know, I've proved that with a, a limited repertoire of moves and physicalities that, you know, you can really draw billions and billions of dollars. So can you imagine if somebody worked hard and worked smart that really had some athletic prowess out there and really could, you know, do the Rey Mysterio stuff and, and really, you know, think through it? It'd be crazy. Oh, don't sell yourself short, Hawk. We've seen a few No, but, but, you know, I'm trying to be humble about this thing because... You know, I'm just waiting for somebody to get it. You know, I really am waiting for somebody to come along and go, okay, this is what it's all about, and this is how it's done. And just don't overthink it, man. Just listen with your heart and your ears, and it'll all come to you. you know, We've seen you throw a few insecurities around in your day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a couple of crazies. But, you know, it's all good, man. It's, I think I just basically have been so loyal to this thing that, you know, there's so many misconceptions about me or so many pre-judgmental type, you know, character things people think about me. They really are blinded by the trees, you know. It's, and it goes way back to promoters wanting not me to do a job. And, you know, Vern Gagne for three years told me never to go down to one knee, you know, and it put me in a spot where everybody said, well, he doesn't want to do a job, he can't work, he can't take bumps. You know, the promoters are going, man, if you go off your feet, we're not going to make any money. You're the Hulk. But just, it's just, it, you need to know the whole picture of this business. I mean, a lot of guys, you know, say, well, Hulk, back at 52 years old, a lot of people don't know of my relationship with Vince McMahon, where when we used to be on the road 90 days, we'd wrestle 120 times in 90 days, and we'd never fly anywhere. We'd drive from Boston to New York, Tampa, back to Atlanta, to Chicago, and there's a lot of stuff here, you know, that's underneath, you know, the history that really, you know, you know sticks its ugly head up today and makes me different than other people. The way I react, the way I think, sometimes I may not say nothing. If there's a reason for it, I just, I just, I just don't do things. I plan things. So it's just, it's a different take on everything, man. Uh, another, uh, another good point as to what you're saying is, is how people view you. Um, you. You know, there's a lot of people out there that kind of try and run your name through the mud. Uh, an example that comes to mind would be like a Randy Savage that goes out and releases the whole CD about you. You know, how do you, as a person? Um, you know, draw up the strength to overcome all that and forge on and still keep everyone kind of in the palm of your hands as far as the fans are concerned. Well, in generalities, you know, thank God people are nipping at my heels and talking about me and jealous and, you know, 
you know, sometimes people celebrate my failures, you know, and it's just a weird take on things. You know, people sometimes, you know, are good people and sometimes are bad people. Randy Savage, for instance, told everybody for three years he was going to kick my butt. I ran into him in Orlando, walked right up to him, went to shake his hand. He wouldn't shake my hand. Didn't want to go outside. He just sat in the chair and he shook for 30 minutes like he was scared to death. I mean, I mean, I've got to tell you something about his character, you know. And it's just, it's a work, man. And, and he knew it was a work. So he could, I'm going to kick Cogram's ass or I'm dating Hulk Cogram's life. He could say whatever he wanted because he knew it was a work. I can't do nothing about it because if I hit him, he'll sue me for everything I got. So, you know, it's, that's his deal. I mean, that's what makes him happy. You know, he lives in misery. So that's his thing. It's not mine. And, you know, there's a lot of people that, like Meltzer was a wrestling observer. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's the greatest, you know, I guess he's the greatest judge of wrestling that's never drawn a dime. So, okay, let's value his opinion. You know, so, I mean, whatever. You know, it's, it's different. I mean, if I was going to listen to anybody, I'd listen to Hulk Hogan or Vince McMahon or, you know, maybe somebody that, you know, knew the business a little bit. But everybody's got a it's, – it's an interesting business. And I read the tabloids. And some of these people that write about movie stars probably have never met them, but they'll sure tell you every emotion and every word out of their mouth. Of course, it's second, third, fourth, and fifth hand, but – so it's just really cool to be involved in something that has so many people stirred up and, you know, on the cutting edge, whether it's good or bad, they all want to know what makes you tick, so it's pretty cool. Indeed. Well, let's take a step back and talk about a little bit about SummerSlam coming up in just a couple of weeks. You're stepping in the ring with Shawn Michaels. The question I have for you is, we just mentioned WrestleMania 3, 93,000 fans there. Does it still get to you? Does it still put butterflies in your stomach to step through that curtain and know you have to deliver and make people who paid their money, you know, make make them happy that they paid their money. Yeah, it's a gut check, you know, because this business can be very, very tough, and you can be only as good as your last match. You know, so if I go out there and fall on my face with Shawn Michaels, and I, and I never had a chance to redeem myself, it could be that end to a you know, 25-year career. Yeah, and so I do get butterflies every time I go out, and, you know, with... The thing of getting older and, you know, the knee replacement, the hip replacement, it really, really puts me in, in the checkmate position with myself because I try to rationalize, okay, I'm here, it's working. Do I need to do this? Why am I doing it? You hear the fans. You want to do it. It's, it's a back-and-forth tug-of-war all the time, you know, so it does give me butterflies for, a, you know, a ton of reasons, business, emotional, physicality, getting out there, chasing the kid around that's half your age. It's, 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 a, it's a weird head trip, man, but it's like, like Puck used to say, what a rush. How much adrenaline actually goes through your system at that point? Do you even feel any effects from, from the hip replacement, so to speak, with all that adrenaline, knowing that the fans are just totally in the palm of your hand? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel everything, brother. It's, it's not like I'm, you know, uh, you know, swimming from the tsunami for, you know, you know the, the fight of my life. It's, I'm not there with it. You know, I've gotten to a point where I'm used to being out there, and more than anything, I'll breathe through, think through things. It's almost like being in a chess game out there where everybody's panicking and going, make a choice, make a choice, but you really have to wait to make the right choice. So it's really a mind game out there. You, know, you can make your body breathe faster or slower. You can make yourself tired or not tired. It's, it's really a huge mind game for me out there. And I, I pride myself on being a survivor out there with guys that can work, guys that can't work. Guys that can talk, can talk, small guys, big guys. It's, I've been able to adapt to um, I mean, if you think of all the people I've wrestled, I've probably drawn more money with more different people than anybody else. I mean, you know, I know Stone Cold and The Rock had a run, and they would wrestle The Undertaker or Triple H on a real consistent basis. But for a while there, I was wrestling different people every night and drawing money with them. So it's, it's you know, I pride myself on the staying power. Well, speaking of reacting to the crowd and knowing what to do, you did something completely unexpected in 1996 when you pretty much went from being the family-friendly hulkster to being the more menacing Hollywood character. Um, let me ask you this. Did you have any reservations about doing it and how it might affect you long term? No, I, I think we're cool with that. I mean, it was something that needed to be done. The whole business, you know, after the WWE demise where I left, and well, I don't mean demise, after my WWE departure and... Uh, WCW run with the red and yellow when the numbers kind of leveled off. Bischoff said, man, what about being a heel? I said, man, it'd be heavy. We may never 
turn back from that point. So the training prayers by them, they, brother, I did it for the money. That whole attitude, kind of like the anti-establishment thing, just jumped on the bandwagon with Stone Cold, and we took it to a whole other level with the NWO, and it showed in the numbers. That we stole most of the universe out there as far as the wrestling audience, and it was a, it could have been a wild ride that was still going if people didn't take their eye off the ball. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that, but... While you were part of the NWO, you called yourself the biggest icon in wrestling. And on the other show, the WWF at the time, WWE Now, Shawn Michaels started calling himself the icon. Um, he started doing that again since he started feuding with you. Does it at all eat at your crawl that he's doing such a thing? No, not at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's a work, you know, and it's something that is good. And it's, it's a great way to characterize yourself. But, you know, this thing is once again taking on a life of its own and you know, they have writers here now, which I really am starting to warm up to because even though I don't use them 100%, they always have something good to give you. And you can really use everything you can get sometimes. And all these writers, you know, Stephanie McMahon, even though I didn't realize that she's pretty much got her finger on the pulse here, and I'm, she's giving me nothing but good material. I twist it around, add stuff, take stuff away, but it always works. And with that being said, you know, the Shawn Michaels who has, you know, found the Lord and has got at peace with himself has those demons still in him because you know the other night in the ring he kind of like took it upon himself to get real personal go off the script and I realized you know what this is a little different than anything I've been in before because the guy that really was trying to bury me and put me out the pasture still has that demon inside of him and if I don't you know put that beast to rest I don't think anybody will so and maybe it's just with me but whatever it is he's crossed the line so this is really going to be a different type of deal for me well, even going back a little bit more here on Raw just this past week, uh, you and Michaels probably had, had a segment that stole the entire show, bar none. Um, and you mentioned two words that used to be taboo in the WWE. Those were, of course, Bret Hart. Um, Bret Hart has, you know, some harsh feelings toward the WWE. He feels he was, uh, quote-unquote, screwed. Um, you yourself had an interesting situation with Vince Russo over at Bash on the Beach in 2000. Um, he's recently been mentioning he mapped out the idea of uh, Jarrett laying down and then Russo himself cutting a promo on you later. How planned was this, or was it all legit? Well, you know, I can't really get into the details of this thing because I guess we're going to court over it. But, really? uh, you know, certain things we had talked about, but then Vince Russo took the liberties to totally change the whole battle plan. You know, otherwise, brother, I wouldn't be going to court, you know, right. if, if this was a work. You know, the, the final, 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 final end of the day outcome, you know, of what was supposed to happen. I mean, Russo can spin it any way he wants, but you know, I'd have to be a real stupid individual <laughs> to take somebody to court over a work. Right. You know, so you can put that in your pipe and smoke it. You know, you'd have to, you know, release a rap CD challenging you to a fight or something stupid like that. What's that? I said you'd have to be pretty stupid, like releasing a rap CD, you know, challenging you to a fight. I guess, man. I mean, you know, if, uh, the truth is, if it was a work like Vince Russo's trying to spin it around to me now, we would be going to court over it. You know that. Yeah. Well, one thing we know is for real is uh, your reality show, Hogan Knows Best. We love seeing the real side of the Hulkster on TV. Now that the series has been proven to be such a, a success, might we be able to see a season two of Hogan Knows Best? Yeah, brother, they're uh, already on that. You know, they've already thrown it at us. It's been in the trade paper, so we're gearing up for round two as we speak. We right actually, I actually just got a couple of weeks, and then we're back doing it again. Oh, excellent. With all the reality shows on television today, what in your mind has made Hogan those best such a success, such a standout? I think we hit a nerve. I think we're back to the, the square one where, you know, what you see is what you get. You know, you got the Osborns over the top, rehab, drugs, kids out of control. And you got, you know, reality shows, going places you've never been, contests, winning money, be something that you're not. You know, Getting married on TV. Whatever, <laughs> you know, do something you've never done, you know. And then they put, you know, nine or ten people in the house for six weeks. Of course, they're going to act up. They're only on TV for a short while. But, you know, they came into our place, and this is what we do, and this is how we act. And we're normal, but whatever dysfunctions we have are normal ones, like, you know, homework and fighting with the wife and the kids acting up and, you know, just pressures of everyday life. So I think people kind of like were dialed into seeing a real reality show and also the wrestling stereotype of Hulk Hogan which everybody's just seen the ball-headed screaming, hey, brother, let me tell you something. Or, you know, Hulk Hogan to turn into Terry and go, hey, Nick, you know, come on, brother, turn the stereo down and do your homework. I mean, see that, I guess, 
you know, and I really can't make a decision on this, but what I've heard, people are interested in just seeing me walk around with a bandana off or in my shorts or the stairs I walk down to my gym or the bed I sleep in and what my cars and my dogs look like, I guess, you know. I would have loved to see, you know, uh, Marilyn Monroe's house and her dogs or John Wayne's stuff or, you know, I mean, I would love to see a lot of stars as, you know, movie stars or celebrities' homes just because I'm curious. So I think it's that curiosity factor of the wrestling fans and the loyalty of the fans and the built-in audience is kind of like, oh, my God, I've watched Hulk for so long, but now I can kind of like see what he's like the other 23 hours a day. So I think we just hit a nerve, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me pose this question to you. you know, of, course, of course, you mentioned uh, several times in other interviews that you pretty much did the show to help springboard Brooke Hogan's music career. Right. And, of course, um, Brooke Hogan has been mentioned a couple times on TV by some of the wrestlers. Any chance you might see her maybe escort you to the ring or anything in that in the future? Brother, you know, I, I'd love to say that will never happen because I've talked about it with her. And that would be my worst nightmare, and maybe it wouldn't be my worst nightmare, but the thing about my daughter getting beat up or hit in the head with a chair, I just can't even comprehend that, or it does not compute. Yeah, yeah. But, in this world we live in, I guess we're going to have to never say never, so not, Can that you that that's no, a... not that that's an open invitation to, you know, for Brooklyn crawling around her underwear in the ring, but, I mean, Jesus, dude, I, I have no idea what lies ahead. Can you give us a, an update on how her music career is, is going at this point in time? Has she... Uh, you know, got, got uh, signed yet? Um, no, no, she hasn't. I mean, I, I thought it was going really good until so about 10 minutes before I talked to you guys. Uh oh. And then I got the crazy call from my wife in LA. So, you know, it, it, it's every five minutes it changes. You know, I think I'm on track with the right people, and, and all of a sudden an A&R guy will change his mind, or somebody from the company will decide to put it off. So it's been like four and a half, five years, or maybe even more of, you know, first off, she had to go to boot camp and get up to speed, but she's ready to move forward and. You know, we're at that sticking point. I just don't know the business well enough, and I just haven't broke through that click, you know, and I haven't gone from evangelist preacher to, you know, greatest manager like, you know, Simpsons old man has, but I'm trying. Uh, i, I got to be honest with you. I think you do have a pretty good pulse on it. Uh, on a recent episode of Hogan Knows Best, uh, you, you didn't really have it out with a, a producer, but you definitely put him in check. Uh, I, I think your quote was, I'm the one that brought us all to the bank. <laughs> well, that, that may have been out of character for me because that sounds like an ego statement, but... I probably did say something like that. I was so upset with the, the flim flam job of them wanting to dye her hair black and cut it short under her ears. I just couldn't let that happen. I don't blame you either. She's got a good look, and I think we all have a definite positive outlook for her in the future. I definitely got to believe she, she'll make it, and there's a market for her out there. I pray to God she gets where she wants to be. Hopefully it'll be this music business, because that was her first choice. Yeah, and she's actually a talented singer, and another thing that I really like about her is she actually, you know, plays keyboard really well, and she sounds really good. Yeah, and she's a good person, man, you know, at the end of the day, and I don't mean to just say this about her because she's my daughter, but she's really a good human being, and I, I told her, I said, anybody that works this hard for so long and is this relentless, something good has to happen for you. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, you know, she'll get that break. And we wish you uh, all nothing but the best. We appreciate your time, Mr. Hogan. It's been an honor to have you on the show. Hey, bro, and, uh, thank you guys for uh, the hey. opportunity, man. This has been really nice of you. Hey, it's, it's our pleasure. So it's good luck with your match at SummerSlam, which is going to be August 21st against Shawn Michaels. And also don't forget to check out Hogan Knows Best on VH1 every Sunday night. We look forward to seeing uh, season number two. And also this week, we look forward to seeing uh, you and your wife get a nice vacation while uh, Brian Knobs babysits the kids. You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio, featuring the interactive interview, courtesy of WrestlingEpicenter.com. And it starts right now. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to a super exciting edition of the Wrestling Epicenter. It's kind of our uh, season debut here, if you will. We're moving to our new Wednesday night time slot at 8.30 p.m. And what a jam-packed show we have for you this week. I can't even begin to describe it to you. I'll say this. We have the immortal Hulk Hogan. Oh, uh, here yeah. Tonight. We also have a Lance Storm. Hopefully, Francine will be calling in momentarily. We got our Raw recap. We got our SmackDown recap. We got our SummerSlam predictions. We're doing big things, as always. It's your boy, Chuck D. Accompanying me is Mr. James Walsh. James Walsh, man, are you ready to do this? Yo, what it do? Yo, what it do? That's the stupidest phrase since bling bling. 
Anyway, it's going to be an incredible show tonight. Well, as we said, we have the immortal Hulk Hogan on the show today. Shoot style interview, 20 minutes. You're going to want to stay tuned and listen to that. We also have Lance Storm with part one because it was such a good and long interview that we're going to bring Mr. Storm on again next week. Uh, I'm telling you what, man. It's almost too big, this show. I, I don't even know. You know, We just got our hour and a half time slot. I still don't know that so we're going to be able to go ahead and fit everything in into our hour and a half time slot. Well, but let's give it a try. We, we will. As of uh, right now, we have Francine on the line. Francine, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. How are you doing, guys? Oh, it's great to speak to you, Francine. We're doing big things. I don't know if you heard or not. We got Hogan on this week. We got Lance Storm on this week. We got you on this week. That's amazing. That's I an would, all-star lineup. <laughs> too much is going on, man. I don't, I don't know if we're going to fit it all in. But uh, why don't I you, don't know either. <laughs> why don't you start out by telling us what you were up to this uh, past weekend? Um. Well, let, let me just tell you, tonight I got my ass kicked at poker. Very upset. I had my poker tournament on the website. That's uh, Missy Hyde and Francine TV dot com? Yeah. Uh, we have it on uh, absolutepoker.com, but mm-hmm. it's, it's mm-hmm. sponsored through me, you know, myself and my site. And um, I just did really bad tonight. I'm very upset about it. Oh, that's no good. Yeah, we had over 100 people. It, it was a lot of fun, though. I mean, I stayed till the end, and there, there's a little uh, section where you can actually chat. So uh, even though I was out quite early, I just stayed until the end and, and just talked to everybody, and we had a really good time. But, right. um, you, you see that right there, James Walsh. That's why it's so good to go to to uh, Francine's website. She'll stay and talk to you, even though she's getting her ass handed to her in poker. I totally did. I really did, and I had a good time. And I just want to thank everybody listening who was there. And for those of you who aren't there and want to play, next one is going to be on September 14th. So stop by the website and check it out. And we'll, of course, um, make an announcement on uh, WrestlingEpicenter.com for that so uh, all our fans can go over there and uh, check that out as well. But, uh, very cool. I, I was yeah, asking. right now I'm, uh, I'm getting ready for uh, my big weekend in Atlanta. Oh, what's going we, on in uh, Atlanta? Oh, we have two pay-per-views this weekend. I'm, I'm on right. both of them. Yeah, I'm doing the Joey Styles pay-per-view, and mm-hmm. I'm also doing the WEW pay-per-view. So I'm double duty on uh, Saturday night. Chuck, you know this. Something uh, Rush just told us. Uh, and, you know <laughs> what, what's actually pretty cool, Francine? We actually have now, uh, joining yourself on the site on our forums, we have uh, Simply Luscious and uh, Amber O'Neill. Oh, they're, they're two great girls. I love them both. Yeah, Very so, cool. So they're uh, now part of the WrestlingEpicenter.com family, which seems to be growing by the week. I know. It, it, we had talked to Lanny Polfo. He's going to be posting for us now as well. Huge. He, it, doing big things. But um, I actually happen to be reading your profile, or I should say it was sent to me, um, that, that you're a big fan of, of the HBO show Six Feet Under. Is this true? Yes. Have you been watching it this season? Okay, stop right there. I only got to see the first episode. Oh, uh-huh. don't tell her anything. Don't tell me because my mom, every week, she's like, oh, my God, you're not going to believe And I'm like, just stop. Because you can't tell me because I have to go and watch it on on the um, in demand or on demand whatever it's called. Uh, oh. I have not seen anything for uh, the first episode. I'm dying to see it, but I've been working and I've been out of town every Sunday, so I've been missing it. You're killing me here. I had a whole good segment where you and I could discuss the, the intricacies I of six know, feet I under. Suck. And I, this is why I I'm totally being, stuck. This is I'm why sorry. I'm being totally quiet because I don't even know what six feet under is. Uh, can it's you believe this guy? It's such a great show it's a it's a family that is in the the undertaking business and the father's dead but i mean they see like all the family members see him they're a little nuts but it it's just got a great plot line and it's like one of the best shows ever created and i've watched it every year and this is the first year that i've actually missed it and the last one is coming up this uh the, this the Sunday. season finale is this Sunday, and That's I have 75 to catch up. Anybody? I know. I t- oh, I, I suck so bad. I totally <laughs> have to catch up. I know. It's awful. I, I was all hoping you'd be like, oh, can you believe this happened and this happened? And I could be like, I know, right? Oh, my God. Don't tell me. I know. I, I'm t- um, if you were to prep me, I would have tried to have caught up. Oh, I that's know. all right. But, you know, don't you guys don't prep me, and I come on here every week unprepared, and I just go with the flow. I'll tell you what. You know what? But y'all got to deal with my... Just uh, lack of... Hey, you know what? Like, it's all good because I didn't even know pay-per-views are coming up, so... I yeah, guess it all leaves out of the end. Stuff, so we just... Kind of, we just... Uh, under you. Well, you, you gotta prep me. Well, you gotta... You, it's all over the internet. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you, you know... Come on now. Pay attention, well, Chuck. Well, we, hey... I knew about it. Well, you're the man. Don't go with me. Yeah, James knows everything. Well, you know, Chuck... I know everything how about it. How can you say James was everything? He's never even seen Six Feet Under. It doesn't involve wrestling, therefore it doesn't no, concern No, he knows everything about wrestling now. Oh, uh, there's more to life than wrestling. you got to give me that. Yeah. There's more oh, to life okay, than yeah. headlocks. 
please. Oh. I, the, oh, please. I, I know all that, but I mean, you know, give me a little bit. Give I used to have a t-shirt. Here. I used to have a t-shirt that said, there's more to life than headlocks. And I wish right. I knew that. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we also have a couple more questions for you wanted to ask this week. Uh, so, okay. so we're going to give us all a chance to redeem ourselves here, okay? We're cool. going to start from scratch. Since okay. we do have Lance Storm on the show, we wanted to see if you had any stories uh, or, or fond memories of working with Lance Storm when he was uh, doing his time in ECW. I believe I was the first manager he ever had. It, I, that is true. You know, uh, your friend Bobby actually mentioned that to us. And, uh, yeah, I, I believe I was. We, uh, I managed him when he was uh, doing a partnership with Candido. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were we were trying to make him like an honorary member of the Triple Threat, but then we uh, two timed him and beat him up instead. So <laughs> it was fun. But um, yeah, I, I wish I would have talked to you before then. There was this one um, one thing we did. I, I I can't remember where it is. I know Lance will remember because he has a better memory than I do. But um, it turned out that that all of us actually ended up pulling our pants down in the ring and ruining the crowd and. Um, it, it, it was a, a really funny, funny thing where we put the belt in front of Shane's penis and then we covered him with a hat and it was just like the timing was perfect and I don't think we ever laughed so hard in the room. It, so, Landstorm um, mooned the crowd. La- yeah, we, we were all <laughs> just, it, it, was, it was just a fun moment and you know, Lance could get loose. I mean, he's, he's not as straight laced as people think he is, but he's a wonderful man and he's a very talented wrestler and, um, you know, hopefully he'll stay active on the indies because um, I, I know he, you know, he's out of WWE and he's he's running his school and I wish him the best of luck. But but he's got a lot of talent left in him, so hopefully he'll do some indie work. I'll actually tell you that he actually, uh, we got a lot of emails asking to book him. And we said, you know, if you want to take these emails, I'll send them over to you. And he's like, no, I don't want to do any indie bookings. I just want to do my school and stay at home. Oh, ah, well, good for him. I mean, he, he's got two beautiful kids. He's got a beautiful wife, so, mm-hmm. you know. I'll tell you what, he was a great guy to talk to. We talked to him for, like, well over an hour, and mm-hmm. uh, we only we, we only got through half our questions. Like, oh, the guy, okay. he's that knowledgeable uh, about wrestling and just really about everything. He's got such, like, a level head. Sure and, does. And, you know, he wasn't really that, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? So I asked. Monotone. Yeah. He was, uh, he was telling jokes, <laughs> and he was making fun of me right on the interview. It, totally. Yeah, he's got a great sense of humor. And, and like I said, he's a good guy and he's a great talent. And uh, I enjoyed working with him. It was Indeed. A lot of fun. Well, we also want to ask you this question. Since we also have Hulk Hogan coming on the show, we want to see what your kind of take on Hulk Hogan was from you know your, your early days watching the business. Um, how did you view Hulk Hogan? What do you feel, you know, in your own personal opinion, he's brought to the table to, to the wrestling industry? Oh, he's huge. I mean, I, I remember when, when he was on top, I wasn't, I'll admit, I wasn't the biggest wrestling fan. I would watch it uh, because I had, my nephews were real young at the time, and they would watch it, so I'd just be sitting there like, yeah, okay, this is great. You know what I mean? But once I, you know, got into business and, and went back and, and here's what he did, he's just huge for the business, and I had so much more respect for him after watching his reality show. Mm. Just the way to see him treat his kids and his wife, and it's—I I just think he's a great guy. You know, I've never met him. I've never had the chance to work with him, um, but I, I don't know. Something about watching him with his family just—it just makes him all that much better to me. You know what I mean? It's—it's—it's it's, it's so nice to see uh, the man out out of his element, and we know he's great in the ring, but to see him at home just puts him over the top. So, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Hulk Hogan. Mm. Absolutely, I am too, and I've always described the show as the reality version of the Brady Bunch. It just seems so wacky and too giddy and happy, but it's still, it's their real life, and that's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, and, and he's a great dad. I mean, I never thought that he wouldn't be, but just to see him with his kids, it's just really touching. It, it is. Just the way he takes the time for his family like that, and, and that's really a nice thing to view because, you know, there's not, there's a lot of people in this world who don't give you know, two craps about anything, and it's nice to see him take time out for his kids. So. We were uh, talking to him about how Nobs uh, from the Nasty Boys was actually going to be babysitting his uh, children. I right? saw that oh, one. That was man. He was hopping was around hysterical. with his crutches, drinking beer, and then he ended up having to put on Hulk Hogan's tights, and I don't know when. What a fiasco it is at that house, man. We got a call by Nobs. <laughs> yeah. It was very entertaining, to say the least, yeah. But that's cool. They're still friends, and, you know, it's hard to maintain friendships in this business as well, because... I mean, you know, as well as I do, you've heard stories of people stabbing in the back. So when you know who your friends are, you hang on to them. And, indeed, you know, indeed. Well, here's yeah. what we're going to do, Francine. We need you to take really good notes this week when you go to those uh, two pay-per-views because we want to hear okay. all about it on next week's show, in-depth details. And you got to watch the season finale of Six Feet Under. 
I can't watch it you until I to. catch up. Oh. What is wrong with you? Uh, you just have. It's gonna be so amazing. Yeah, that's like, like walking into a movie theater an hour into the movie. But she can. Seriously, like what? I, 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 there's no way. Today's Wednesday. Uh, there's no way in hell I'm gonna catch up by Sunday. Mm -hmm. oh, it's such a good I season. I, I know. I, 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 I suck this week. I'm sorry. No, you I never suck. I have so much scene. going on. <laughs> <laughs> I <Never>. had so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had so much going on, and uh, I I just have not been around on Sunday nights to do it, and and that is my fault. But I will catch up eventually. Fair enough, Francine. We thank you for yes. calling in. As always, we will talk to you next Wednesday, eight thirty. And uh, w once again, you can always 8 check. Eight thirty. We yeah, eight thirty. Oh, what time? Oh, it's eight thirty there. It's yeah, three hours okay, it's, yeah. it's like almost midnight here. I am so see, I'm so backwards. You guys. Are you sound so chipper for being so late at night. I it. You know what? Are I'm, you a night person? I, I stay up till about like two, three in the morning every night. Uh, so welcome yeah. to the club. Yeah. yeah, I like to sleep a little later. She's now an officially a, a member of WrestlingEpicenter.com for sure. I, yeah. I am so happy to be a part of. <laughs> That's when everything goes down, man. <laughs> late it's at night unreal. on our site. <laughs> That's it's, gotten, yeah. it's gotten to the point that I started taking my phone off the hook at one o'clock because this crazy asshole over here calls me at three o'clock in the morning and it's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "I'm sleeping." He loves you. See, one of these days you're gonna be sitting there and say, "I wish that crazy asshole would call me." Oh man. <laughs> anyway, guys, Francine, we appreciate you calling in. Don't forget to check out Francine on. Uh, Missy Hyde and FrancineTV.com, also foreverfrancine.com as well. Francine, we'll speak to you next week. Okay, guys, sounds good. Thank Take you. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. And that was the Queen of Extreme, Francine, right here at WrestlingEpicenter.com, one of the triple threat that's going to be on this show. Up next is the Lance Storm interview, but before we get to that, we're going to come right back with Monday Night Raw Talk. So make sure you keep it locked right here to the Wrestling Epicenter, only on ASU's original alternative, The Blaze, 1260. AM. Woo! Call the Blaze Request Line at 480-965-1260. Request your favorite song. 480-965-1260. The Blaze, 1260 AM. She's going up. Hulk Hogan, he built the big leg on him. He's now for the cover of the leg one. And uh, in case you guys couldn't tell, we're back here. We're doing a little uh, tribute kind of to Hulk Hogan here this evening. We're going to go through and we're going to play some various clips of uh, some of the most important career highlights of Hulk Hogan's career. Right at the end of that clip, Gorilla Monsoon said, Hulkamania is here, and tonight Hulkamania really is here. Right at the end of the program, you're going to get an opportunity to listen to a 20-minute shoot interview with the immortal Hulk Hogan. We're going to get into a little bit of raw discussion in just a few minutes here. We're going to get a caller on the air in just one second, okay? So, what did you think of Raw overall last night, Mr. D? You know, I thought Raw was actually an excellent show. Um, the build for SummerSlam on, on the end of, of Raw, as far as Raw is concerned, um, unfortunately, I can't say the same about SmackDown, has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, e even just the start of this Monday's show. Brian, we got you on the phone, right, buddy? Yes. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about this opening segment for Raw here. What actually happened was, I'm driving home, right? I'm on the 10 out here in uh, Arizona, and all of a sudden James calls me, and he's like, Shawn Michaels is cutting a promo. And I'm like two minutes away from my house, man. And I'm on a, like a 45 mile speed limit road. I'm like, Boom! totally just gun the car. I'm like, gotta get home, gotta get home. And uh, unfortunately, I, I want to shoot myself for this. I missed the actual part where they played Breath the Hitman Hearts music. And James Walsh was totally freaking out on the phone. He's like, he's coming out, he's coming out. Oh my God. And, and I finally got back to see probably about the last 10 minutes of this promo, and it was vintage, vintage Shawn Michaels. He was taking his clothes off, laying in the middle of the ring, just really getting underneath the skin of the Montreal crowd. Walsh, I know you got a lot to say about this segment. Got to forgive me, guys, but I had a mark out moment when that Bret Hart theme song hit, because it realized, I realized that there's a good opportunity that he might not come out this time. But I did realize one other thing. Same thing as Matt Hardy. When they played his theme song, that signaled to me he's coming back. When they play Bret Hart's theme song, he's coming back. Oh my God! I almost crapped myself. I th I, I was I was uh, I wasn't even paying attention to what my, Shawn Michaels was saying. Then I just heard that music. And I was in another room, and I came running and crashing through, opened the door, and it's like, is Bret Hart coming out? 
and then he didn't, and I was like, oh, crap. But I'll tell you what, there's never been such a situation in WWE history where they've really taken the time, you know, when, when they're in Montreal, to really go ahead and recognize this situation. And, man, this got Shawn Michaels over as a heel in probably one of the bigger waves I've seen. I've been saying it for weeks. Shawn Michaels needs to define himself as the heel in this feud because a mixed reaction at SummerSlam would be detrimental to the match, especially if it's going to be the main event, as they keep saying it will be. Well, he's, he's 100% heel now. Absolutely. I hope it stays in uh, in Washington, D.C. I hope that sticks. Well, I'll tell you what. Anyone that watched that show, wh whoever fan watched that show, when Shawn Michaels comes to their town next, they're going to boo him, and they're going to boo him seriously. Well, you know what he opened the door for. And we just got to a point where I was thinking, I'm tired of hearing it, but now you're going to start hearing. If they don't bring Bret Hart at SummerSlam, I think they will. You're going to start hearing, we want Bret, and you screwed Bret. Now, what are the chances in your mind, Brian, that they're going to go ahead and bring Bret the Hitman Hart back? To SummerSlam? To, uh, uh, for any, uh, yeah, SummerSlam or per perhaps uh, the next WWE pay-per-view. SummerSlam, about 20%, maybe. 15, 20, maybe. Uh, WrestleMania, Hall of Fame, I would say probably about a 95. I think he'll be back for the Hall of Fame. I, I personally, myself, don't see him coming back ever again to wrestle in the WWE ring. No, not wrestle, never, no. I disagree with that. I really disagree with that. Now, I know logic is, is not on my side here, but they ended the show, and we'll get to this in just a few minutes, with Shawn Michaels applying the sharpshooter to Hulk Hogan in the middle of the ring in Montreal and saying that he's going to screw Hulk Hogan again the same way that he screwed Bret Hart in 1997. Now, if he's challenging Bret Hart to come out and face him, then applies the sharpshooter, then says he's going to do the same thing to Hogan, how much more groundwork could they lay for a Bret Hart return? Yeah, if he doesn't come back, they're making a vital, vital mistake. But is he going, does he want to do that? I mean, I mean, it's just, uh, Bret Hart is very, very, very serious about his career. And I think that would tarnish his career to go into an There's another thing Bret Hart that. is very serious about, and that's money. And if they <laughs> offer Bret Hart a lot of money, he would do it. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to hurt the integrity of Bret the Hitman Hart. I think the fact that he held out eight years from returning to the WWE speaks volumes about his actual character. I'm shocked that he is going back. I always made fun of people when they said, Bret Hart's coming back at WrestleMania. No, I didn't think it would ever happen. Now, I'm actually a believer, and I will go as far as to say, I will wager any number of money with Chuck right now that Bret the Hitman Hart will walk out during that main event at SummerSlam. You know, I'm not going to go ahead and wager money on this because I actually would love to see it happen. Don't oh, get me wrong. I would love it. I mean, uh, I, it would make the pay-per-view itself worth, you know, $100 versus the $49 that we're all going to pay. But we got to move right along. Brian, we appreciate your call this week, buddy, and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you next on Wednesday. Yeah, sure. All right, have a good one, man. Keep doing the news. And uh, we're going to go on to our first match we actually saw here of Raw, which was uh, the Heartthrobs versus Big Show in a handicap match. The Big Show obviously went over in this one. Um, I I'm a little surprised by this, i got to be honest with you. I would have thought that perhaps the Heartthrobs could have put up a little bit more of a fight in this one. Uh, you know, they're one of the very few tag teams the WWE actually has access to. Man, our phone is ringing off the hook here, James. Well, speak on this first match. I really thought it was a mistake to kill a tag team with one wrestler, especially one that's not even over with the Big Show. Big Show would be best served to get somebody over, such as sh sh Chris Masters. Chris Masters and Big Show have been teasing a feud for so long, and instead of getting that, we're getting unexplained matches at SummerSlam, just one unexplained match at SummerSlam, but I'd rather see a burn-off to that Chris Masters and Big Show feud. Indeed. We're going to move right along into our next match, which was the Eugene Invitational. It was Rene Dupree versus Eugene. I'm kind of surprised by the reaction Rene Dupree got. He's got a different look. We haven't seen him on TV in a while, and he seemed to get a relatively warm reception from the Canadian faithful. They're in Montreal. He's a French-Canadian. What do you expect? <laughs> Mike, we got you on the phone, right, buddy? Yeah. All right, man. They're, really booking, they're really booking Eugene in really bad situations. Oh. He's against Kurt Angle in Philadelphia, or Pittsburgh, where Kurt Angle's from. And then he's against Rene Dupree in French Canada. I indeed. Now, now, what I want to actually talk to Mike about for, for this week is, Mike Mike always calls in, he's a, he's a great guest of our show, it's always a pleasure to have him on the air with us, is the Diva Search competition, Mike, we actually saw the finale of this, do you think it was a good idea to have Ashley win this Diva Search competition, or should you have seen it going another way? Um, my, vote, my vote was definitely on Layla, because, I mean, uh, it doesn't really matter to me, because I'm actually glad Ashley won, but I just know for a fact, Layla will get a contract for WWE, just like because I also because last year I also voted for Maria 
and she still got a contract uh, to the WWE. Mm-hmm. And I say Lila will come back and will be a super heel or like a manager to somebody. I just know she's going to come back. I agree with Eric Clapton. Lila's got me on my knees. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I got to be honest with you. I think all these three finalists are going to end up getting a contract. Now, the reason I'm kind of excited, and I think this could potentially end up saving the competition, is that I actually legitimately think the WWE and the fans picked the right person for this. Ashley's got that same kind of uppity spunk, a la Christy Hemi. She's actually taking the time to go and get professionally trained for wrestling. So uh, I think they've actually, you know, made a good decision here and can actually have, you know, maybe in two, three years, a future female wrestler if they decide to go back and go ahead and build up the tag team division. Or or women's division, excuse me. Absolutely, but another thing is when you saw her come out last night, I didn't look at her as some wannabe diva. I saw her and I thought, wow, she looks like a star. And that's what Christy Hemme had that set her aside from the rest. And that's what Layla, or whatever her name is, Ashley has that set her, sets her aside from the rest. Indeed. Now, I want to talk to you guys about a quick segment we saw also on Monday Night Raw, which was uh, Bischoff with Carlito and Jericho. I thought this was a tremendous segment. Um, I was kind of concerned going into Raw, being in Canada, how well Chris Jericho would be able to stay a heel. Um, it seems like some of John Cena's crowd responses have slightly dwindled. Uh, he's still over his hell, don't get me wrong. They've just gone down a, uh, maybe a notch or two. And I'm thinking to myself, there's got to be a good way that they can get Chris Jericho to really get some phenomenal heel heat. And I couldn't have seen a better way to do it than pair him up with Bischoff and Carlito, wrap themselves in the Canadian flag. We saw Carlito kind of wiping his ass with the Canadian flag. I mean, they went the full nine yards on this and really got Jericho going over his heel in his hometown of Montreal. Can we say that on the air? We can say that on the air, brother. Oh, good, good, good. I didn't want to get thrown up here. Oh, I thought it was a good segment. I think it's a good idea to pit Chris Jericho with Carlito. However... It does limit Carlito because now there's no Intercontinental Championship match at SummerSlam, which really does hinder him, especially when three weeks ago it was pretty clear that they were building towards Carlito against Shelton at SummerSlam. Go ahead, Mike. What are your thoughts on this segment? Uh, segment? Uh, I thought it was because I, don't, because I didn't think they would like pull off any other thing that would be better uh, than the Canadian uh, flag. Um, uh, you, want me, uh, wait, the, you want me to talk about the match too, right? Uh, no, we, we haven't gotten to the match yet, but we, you know what? We'll go right into that match. There was obviously Carlito and Chris Jericho taking on John Cena. Um, now you can speak on the match, Mike. <laughs> okay. Um, I thought the match was okay. Uh, John Cena, and I didn't think John Cena should have won the match. It was like kind of ridiculous. Um, but the thing I'm depressed about is that I heard that SummerSlam could be the last match for Chris Jericho. This is an interesting point that's been kind of a, an internet hotbed right now. Mike, we got to let you go real quick, though, buddy. We're going to speak on this real quick. But uh, hopefully we'll hear from you next Wednesday, my man. Yeah, sure. All right, brother. Thanks for the call. Yeah, later. Have a good one. We apologize to our in-ring callers or our on-phone callers, I should say. we got to keep things rolling today. we got a packed show. I really do think that John Cena should not have gone over in this match. If they're going to build towards Chris Jericho against John Cena at SummerSlam, etiquette would dictate that they would be proof that Jericho can put Cena's shoulders to the mat for a three count, and they did not do that this week. But I will say this, that chair shot that Jericho delivered to Cena? It looked sick. Oh, that looked like it hurt. That, that really looked like it knocked Cena a little bit loopy, but it, it, there, we have to quickly address the situation with uh, Chris Jericho perhaps being gone for the WWE for an indefinite period of time. Um, how, how does this uh, strike you, man? Do you, are you glad Jericho's going to go ahead and take the time off, or, or do you wish he would stay around a little bit longer? I've always been a proponent of having contracts that are um, limited in terms of how many appearances per year you make because if people are there every single day for weeks they can easily easily get burned out and quite frankly I'm tired of seeing Jericho I was tired of seeing Rob Van Dam before he got injured and I'll tell you this much I just hope I hope that now with all these changes and that fact that Jericho be, could be going that somebody else can step up and take his place and maybe see Mr. Jericho can take a step down to TNA and do something for an upstart commercial company like that. I, I think we'll eventually see him back in the WWE. That's my personal opinion. But we got to move right along here. We saw Val Venus taking on Edge also on Monday Night Raw. I always love watching Val Venus work. Him and Edge actually had a phenomenal match. Yes, they did. And it was a fairly good squash match. I got an opportunity to watch the match. And Mr. Edge got a win by the submission hold, which he hasn't used in quite some time. They did a really good job with that match. I'll tell you that for sure. That was a really excellent match. It was not a squash match, and the Val Venus is, uh, you know, Val Venus has been using the job of late, but they did not make him look that weak in that match. No, Val Venus looked phenomenal. Val Venus is always in excellent shape, and another good match. Um, I think we all knew that, that Edge was going to go ahead and go over on this one. 
But why don't we move on to our next match, which was uh, the Hurricane versus Rob Conway. We also have uh, Mike, a.k.a. Dynamite Kid, coming to us from our WrestlingEpicenter.com forums. Mike, you got to give me the four-on-one on what do you think of this Rob Conway character. Is he the reincarnation of Buff Bagwell personified or what? Man, I, personally, I, I don't I don't understand the push on the guy. I mean, it's pretty clear he's not getting over with anybody. I mean, he comes out, there's absolute... I think we actually just lost Mike there. I think he was on the cell phone. Mike, you with us? All right, Mike. Oh, lost Mike. I'll tell you what, Mike. you got to give us a call back next week because we're packed. we got to keep moving right along. I actually think it's a good idea to give Conway this push. Um, it, it takes time to get people over. We're in such a state of the WWE right now where people feel like if you're not successful in the first three, four weeks, your push is over with. If you give Rob Conway some time, this character can get over. If you give anything some time, anything can get over. Lance Storm and us had this a long conversation about how they have to slow down. They have to go back to the days of wrestling challenge and superstars where they were nothing but squash matches and characters could build. Indeed, they, they definitely do. We want to move on to our final match here of the evening. Obviously, in that match, Rob Conway went over uh, the hurricane. But uh, it was actually kind of interesting to see Stacy so much involved with this. But uh, they, they put on a good backstage segment. But unfortunately, we really don't have the time to delve into every segment that, that, that goes on. We also saw Kurt Angle versus Hulk Hogan in the final match of the evening. Funny enough, we're you know, going to start with Hulk Hogan. We're going to end with Hulk Hogan. You know, it, It's a great show overall. Uh, but uh, this was actually a better match than I thought. Kurt Angle really sold well for Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan really sold well for Kurt Angle. You can see clearly that they had a lot of respect for each other in the ring. Oh, how could you not respect either of these guys in the ring? Hogan always gets a bam rap, and he'll talk about this in the interview, for not doing a lot in the ring. The bottom line is he doesn't have to do a lot in that ring. And what he does do is sufficient. And what we saw last night, or two nights ago, I should say, on Raw, was a guy in there that was doing what he could do, and that crowd ate it up. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give you credit. I felt like sometimes uh, I was cringing a little bit at times, thinking maybe Hulk Hogan was in a little bit more pain th than I've, you know, used to see him as. You know, he just celebrated what his 53rd birthday, 52nd birthday, 52nd, 52nd. You know, for him to get out there and still get the reaction he does is testament to this man's legacy as it is. Um, you know, obviously the big boot didn't look phenomenal on Raw, um, but I'll tell you what, he took some stiff bumps from Kurt Angle. But uh, you know, we, we all know Kurt Angle is very capable in the ring of protecting his opponent. Um, but, but Hogan was still flopping around more than I had expected to see him in that match. And as Shawn Michaels keeps saying, he's going to have to step it up at SummerSlam if it's the main event. You're going to see Hulk Hogan deliver. And as we found out in the past couple of years, when Hogan is on a grand scale and everything depends upon it, Hogan Rock at WrestleMania, for example, Hogan can deliver. And that's where we're going to leave off with this week's Raw Rewind. We're going to take a quick commercial break here. We're going to come back with our Lance Storm interview. Make sure you keep it locked right here to the Wrestling Epicenter, which can be found only on ASU's original alternative, The Blaze 1260 AM. Yay. The Blaze 1260 AM is on the World Wide Web at TheBlaze1260.com. Listen to The Blaze online. Check out our concert calendar. And so much more. TheBlaze1260.com. ASU's original online alternative. the mouth of the south jimmy hart the world's greatest wrestling manager if i do say so myself and you're listening to the interactive interview that's number one baby enjoying what you're hearing be sure and check out wrestlingepicenter.com on social media at facebook.com slash wrestling epicenter on twitter at james epicenter and of course WrestlingEpicenter.com for 24-hour news updates, our interview archives, and all the other information you've come to expect from the Wrestling Epicenter. Mr. Lance Storm. Lance Storm, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing fantastic. I'm at home in Calgary, so I'm always great. Excellent. Well, let's get right into it. You're getting ready to open a wrestling school, Lance Storm. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about that endeavor? Uh, yeah, Storm Wrestling Academy will be up and running uh, September 12th. Um, it's been something that's been in the back of my mind, I think, probably since practically I broke in. Um, you know, my, the year after I graduated uh, camp, I actually helped uh, train here in Calgary for the Hearts for two years. And I kind of got a taste for it then and found out that I enjoyed teaching and was somewhat good at it. Um, so it's sort of always in the back of my mind that maybe when I was done wrestling and getting off the road, this would be something I could do. And then, I, I, what, a year and a half ago, when the chance came to uh, instruct for World Wrestling Entertainment and OVW um, as their uh, lead instructor for developmental talent. I thought, you know, 
know, hey, this is my chance to uh, give it a go again. So I jumped on that. And after a year and a half in OVW as an instructor, um, I, I found that it was uh, something I really enjoyed. And, I, I, you know, I felt that I was making a difference. And uh, so I started talking with my wife about the possibility of getting completely off the road. And she convinced me that maybe doing this on my own would be far better than traveling back and forth from Louisville or Atlanta. And uh, we decided to take the jump. And I'm now home permanently and thrilled to death about it. And I'm just in the process of cleaning up and decorating my building and getting ready. And I'm really excited for the September start. Well, we've got an interesting question coming in from our forums on WrestlingEpicenter.com, just for anybody out there who wants to check that out. Um, question coming in is, how the hell do you get the super kick to look so damn good? Uh, just lots of practice, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I got a couple of comments from that, and I thought it was kind of funny that people pulled that out, especially with Shawn Michaels now doing the Sweet Chin music pretty much to everybody. Yeah, actually, uh, I got a huge compliment just recently on someone who had taken both, and they thought mine looked equally as good, and mine was a hell of a lot lighter. So <laughs> I take pride in, in, in making it look a hell of a lot stiffer than it really is. Um, and, and it's just timing and keeping your eye on the ball. Somebody wants to tell you that you couldn't crack an egg with it? Uh, Jerry Lynn did, yeah. We, uh, especially because we used to, we do used to do it out of uh, a similar spot each time, and it got to the point where he would, you know, feed his chin around like a blind man. And I've even got a photo up my website where he's literally like just sitting around and throwing his chin out there. A lot of wrestlers seem to not necessarily embrace the internet community. You yourself has kind of gone another route with opening your own website, answering a lot of fans' questions. What was your thinking behind doing that, being more open with the internet community? Um, I, I think it's important to embrace um, all of your fans. Um, I, I think wrestling needs all the support it can get. And, and I think uh, a way to earn respect from fans is to treat them with some degree of respect. And, you know, granted, there's, you know, the Internet fans out there that think they know absolutely everything and they, you know, think they know more than the people in the business and, you know, criticize it horribly and just are down on it. And you just have to take them with a grain of salt and say, you know, that's their opinion and, let them bitch and complain if they want to, but there's a lot of great wrestling fans out there that are online or not online, and I think we need to try to support them as much as we can and um, treat them with a little bit of respect, because without them, you know, the buildings get pretty empty. One of the first times I uh, had the opportunity to really see yourself in depth as far as wrestling was, of course, in ECW. Um, one of the first feuds I recall was uh, with the late Chris Candino. Um, what are your memories of working with Chris? It was great working with Chris, because Chris and I were, were good friends as well as we both liked to work with each other. And it was one of those things where, you know, when we were doing the, the whole angle with Tammy and stuff, it's like the gloves were off and there was never a worry that we'd be offending each other. We'd just do whatever we wanted. And, and it was so fun that we would each push each other and there was never, I think, any doubt in either one of our minds that it was our, both of our goals were the match and it wasn't, you know, whether he got enough or I got enough or who looked stronger or who won. It was always just about going out and having the most fun we could and having the best match we could. So it was really great. And it was also great for me because it was really my first my first speaking role where I gave him a chance to really come into my own as a personality. And having someone that I was completely comfortable with to just do whatever I wanted, do whatever felt right came out, that, you know, he really helped me along with Paul's instructions, obviously, too, in, in finding myself as a performer, not just as a wrestler. And, and so it was a really important time to well, this, this is always something that interests me um, personally about the business. Um, when I look at some of the great technical wrestlers yourself, the, the Chris Benoit, um, the Eddie Guerrero, why does it feel like it takes longer for them to get over versus someone like The Rock, not discounting his in-ring abilities? Um, but, you know, for Chris Benoit, it took years and years and years uh, of doing, you know, amazing technical wrestling before people really learned to respect him. Um, and really allow him, you know, to, to end up being, obviously, the world heavyweight champion at a time. Um, why does it take so much longer? And is there something that can be done differently to kind of, um, do you think, showcase those technical abilities and help the real solid technical wrestlers get over sooner? Uh, I think pushing them would do it. I, I, I think people really, uh, and by people I mean the creative process of booking people and stuff, don't realize that in today's day and age, if you're not winning, you're not going to get over. Right. And it's one of those things where, and, and granted, Rock took a while to get over, too. You know, right. it's, it's not like when he first started, the Rocky die, Rocky die chance, he was getting over like a million bucks. Right, right. You know what I mean? It's, but he was pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. Well, I mean, Rocky 
Rocky Maivia wasn't over, but The Rock did get over. No, The Rock certainly got over. But yeah. you know, it, you know, it, it wasn't his first day that he got over. And I think you know, you take someone like Eddie and Benoit. It's like you know, how many times were they used to get other people over? How many times were they the one laying on their back? And how many times were they the one carrying lesser talented people, making them look good, and then having them win? And you know, even the fans that know the business of the work. You don't want to sit there in the crowd and cheer for somebody and cheer for somebody when you know they're going to get beat. One of the biggest criticisms that anybody ever gives you is that you're not the greatest on the mic. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and fast forward a little bit and just say, we interviewed Hacksaw Jim Duggan about six months ago, and Hacksaw made a comment that you weren't able to step it up on the mic to match him. And I think that he didn't understand that, you know, while he's, he's intense and stomping around, you're, you know, can I be serious for a minute? Uh, do you think that people just don't understand your style? I mean, because I remember Austin came out as well and uh, called you boring, and I thought that was kind of, you know, stupid and ended up hurting your career. Well, that wasn't Austin's idea. That was what was booked. But um, I think one of the biggest things is, with the exception of the ECW stuff with Tammy, which I thought were, were good promos, some of the stuff I did with Tommy was for good promos. I'm not talking about, you know, I'm going to electrify the crowd like rock, but good, solid promos, um, or some of the Team Canada stuff that I did. I never had an angle or anything important to talk about. And so when was I going to be cutting a really great promo? And I would, uh, not to open up a can of worms here, but what the hell, uh, does anybody remember Jim Duggan cutting a good promo? <laughs> um, I mean, the whole thing got over, but that's pretty much the end, beginning and the end of it. Exactly. The, the, the whole one was something around, but that's not exactly carrying the, the stick. Right. And, you know, I could have, if I wanted to, you know, stormed around behind Stephanie McMahon during the invasion angle, you know, get inciting the crowd to sing, you know, oh, Canada or you suck or whatever else, chant USA during her promos, and it would have been distracting. It's not to say Steph's not cutting a good promo, it's just I'm distracting what the whole, you know, angle is. Right. You know, I was rather annoyed when I heard uh, Jim's comment, to be perfectly honest. Hmm. Not like he was cutting a promo and I was cutting a promo and his promos were getting over. He was stomping around in the back doing his hack hug Jim Duggan character, which he wasn't even supposed to be at that point in time because he had shaved his beard, cut his hair. And now it's supposed to be the straight and narrow, not overly uh, amplified American anymore. He was supposed to be the straight and narrow, I don't rant and rave, I don't stomp around and make noise, because I am now part of Team Canada. But unfortunately, Jim didn't understand his character. That yeah. he was supposed to have changed. He was doing his old gimmick, trying to get himself over to keep his job, and was distracting from my angle, and the office pulled it. What do you feel uh, about the current kind of shoot promos that the WWE is trying to, uh, I guess, foster at this point in time? Do you think those are, are beneficial or will prove to be detrimental in the long run? Um, it depends specifically on what they are. I, I don't mind, sh you know, shoot promo s stuff. I think like um, Candido and I did um, in ECW, or even some of the stuff that you know Dreamer and I sort of you know half did on each other. I think it rang true and people knew it rang true, but I think when you actually break kayfabe and, and talk about, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to have to go backstage and, and politics for the finish? Or, you know, Kane and Lita was just a storyline, this is real. I think when you do that, I think you hurt the product because why am I supposed to care about all the other matches when someone is actually telling me, well, this one here is actually real, this means something, the rest is all just made up crap. You know, I, I don't think we want to go to that. I don't think we want to go to, you know, uh, you're going to have to go and, you know, do some backstage politics and get the finish because I'm not going to shut down for it. I disagree with that. All right, sports fans out there, that's right. It's Brutus, the Barber Beefcake, and you are listening to Interactive Wrestling radio. The Wrestling Epicenter has been around since 2002, and in that time, all these guests, everybody pictured, has been on our podcast. We're more than just a radio show, though, so check out WrestlingEpicenter.com for all your wrestling news and needs.
And there he was, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lance Storm. He was such a pleasure to talk to. That's only part one. We're breaking this up into two parts. We did it over an hour and seven minutes with the guy, for God's sakes. So uh, next week, we're going to bring to you Lance Storm part two. That was only uh, the tip of the iceberg. We're going to have the full audio link up in two weeks over at WrestlingEpicenter.com. You guys can check that out in our uh, interviews, archives. James, I know we both were huge Landstorm fans before this interview. Chuck, let me ask you this question. Go for it, buddy. What shirt am I wearing right now? You're wearing a Landstorm t-shirt. Yes, I am. Am I a mark or what? Well, you know, I was always a huge Landstorm fan for his technical in-ring abilities, but uh, after doing this interview with him, uh, I gained that much more respect for the guy. He has such a good level head and firm grasp of the knowledge. You can always learn more about Mr. Landstorm by checking out uh, stormwrestling.com. Um, it's a great website. It's a great way to interact with Mr. Landstorm himself. Let me ask you this. Who else in this world would you want to be trained to wrestle than somebody of the ilk of Lance Storm? The guy is phenomenal. He's the best of his generation in technical wrestling. Uh, you know, he was he, he has that lineage, you know what I mean? He was trained in, in the dungeon. Um, he was a true student of the game. You, you'd always talk about, you know, some of the best technical wrestlers. Obviously, Bret Hart comes to mind. Um, you know, Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, Kurt Angle, and Lance Storm's always, you know, in that same mold as, as those guys. Absolutely, and I wish they would have done what he said they should have done with him. And that's just let him get in the ring, let him wrestle, and forget the stupid gimmicks. Yeah, you know, that's kind of what they've done with, with Chris, Bowen, Chris Benoit, excuse me, to, to some degree. Um, you know, they, they really just let him work, and eventually he earned the respect of the fans. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, our phone lines are open. Feel free to call in. The number is 480-965-1260. We're trying to get as many phone calls in as we can here this evening. we uh, we got an absolutely packed show. But it was phenomenal to talk about, uh, uh, to, to sit down and actually spend such time with Lance Storm. Um, you know, n next week's part two is going to be no more less impressive. Tell you what's also impressive. Sitting down every week with the absolutely gorgeous Queen of Extreme, Francine. Can you believe how great she is? You know what? She is a, a true class act. Um, you know, she always goes out and, and always has to some degree. Goes out, you know, in the ring and, and does the best of her abilities and, and really gives it her all. I've always been a proponent of saying she is the complete female performer. Never, bo never before has there been a diva that actually looks good that is willing to get powerbombed off the top rope through a table. Well, I'll tell you what, dude. We, we have some hardcore. not bad ones on our forums right now. Oh, uh, absolutely. Amber O'Neill from WEW, as well as the beautiful Simply Lushes. We just did an interview with Simply Lushes. You can hear on our internet show at wrestlingepicenter.com. We're going to have a caller here in just a few minutes, but I want to remind you, coming up in just a few minutes, can you feel it, Chuck? We got the immortal one. The greatest wrestler of all time, for my money, my opinion, the immortal Hulk Hogan. Mike, are you with us this time, buddy? I'm with you. All right, man. What did you want to speak on before, man? I feel terrible you got cut off. What, what do you uh, want, a cell phone? No, nah, don't worry about it, man. I, I was just basically saying that, you know, I really didn't feel that uh, Conway was over, and I don't really blame him. I mean, I blame management. I, I think they've shown their track record is they really just don't know how to get guys over anymore. I mean, a gimmick like that would have worked when I was a kid in the 80s, and it just doesn't seem to work now. It's kind of management and the fans as well. You know, these fans, they want people flying through tables and killing themselves just to get a round of applause. And, how, you know, you can't go out and do that every week. You'd have the shortest career ever. Well, what do you think of my idea of maybe having a secondary show that's like, and I know you're probably going to say a velocity or heat, but something that was like a superstars or challenge from when we grew up that... Right has squash matches where you can get get to see the guy beat a bunch of nobodies, get his finisher over, establish a character, and still, when he gets in the ring with somebody special, you can really see what they got. Oh, absolutely. That, that would be, that, that's what's missing today. Everything is, is, is you know, it's, it's, you got Raw, which is live, and you got SmackDown. It's really the only two shows, and then you got Heat and Velocity, and they don't even push guys on that right. I mean, look at uh, Kazarian. Mm -hmm. You know, him go. I mean, there was a funny story that uh, we actually talked about on our uh, new hotline over at PWInsider.com uh, last night that's in the Elite Members section. Um, we were discussing a little bit about Frankie Kazarian's release from the WWE, and apparently what really got under his skin was he went up to uh, a creative uh, storyline writer for the WWE and mentioned to him, you know, I had this great idea for my character. And the, right. uh, the, the writer for the WWE looked at him and said, uh, this is a, just a tryout match for you, buddy. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched. Which, the funny part about that is, Frankie Xerian is a relatively large name. You know what I mean? He right. was Mr. TNA for a while. And this creative writer did not even know Frankie Kazarian was on the WWE roster. I mean, it, that's the equivalent of me asking you guys to write a horror flick. I mean, not saying that nobody has the talent to do it, but I mean, 
how can you bring people in who are Nickelodeon writers to write a wrestling show? Absolutely. Like I said last night, it's like these people who came from this ilk writing an episode of Friends without realizing that Ross and Chandler are part of the cast. Right. You can't exactly. do it. Exactly. You or can. You... I mean, you got to look at it like this. I mean, you, you take it, you know, we grew up on wrestling in its heyday. Right. So, I mean, you take somebody from that era or somebody that has that knowledge, they know what wrestling is all about because they're a fan. It's like me asking my mother to, to, to write a wrestling show. I mean, you can't do it. If you have no knowledge of where the business came from, how the hell can you know where the hell to take it? Well, well absolutely. And let me just say this before we have to end the segment because we're really running uh, short on time. But another thing that really bothers me is if they haven't followed the business, that means they also don't know what has failed in the past. Right. And if they don't know what's failed in the past, how are they going to prevent themselves from making the same mistakes? Absolutely. You can't do it. I mean, I... I it, it boggles my mind that a man who created WrestleMania and, this, and, and wrestling today to make it what it is would allow this to go on. I mean, I don't have any answers, but I, I hope somebody comes up with an alternative that, that is interesting because right now WWE ain't doing it for me. Indeed. We appreciate your call, Mike. We sorry you got cut off before. but Don't uh, worry about it. Hopefully we'll hear from you uh, on the show in the future, my man. I'll be there next week, my man. Yeah. Keep up the good work, right. guys. Thanks a lot, brother. No problem. All right, guys, this time we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back with our SmackDown Rebound. Hopefully that's not copyright infringement. But nonetheless, you're listening to the Wrestling Epicenter with your boy Chuck D. James Walsh by my side as always. You can find us only on ASU's original alternative, The Blaze, 1260 AM. Yay! Call The Blaze request line at 480-965-1260. Request your favorite song. 480-965-1260. The Blaze, 1260 AM. Thank you for the memories. Thank you for the inspiration. And thank you. That was the one and only Vince McMahon thanking Hulk Hogan for the memories at WrestleMania 9. What a great interview it's going to be in just a few moments as we're going to be joined by the one and only immortal Hulk Hogan. But before we get there, why don't we walk through what happened last Thursday night on SmackDown. I'll tell you what, man. When we were on a Tuesday, it was difficult to, to remember all that far back. Now, with a day later, my mind's that much more fried, and I have a hard time getting back to next uh, last uh, Thursday, man, but uh, we're going to try and give it our best shot. What we might want to do is make it a half review of last week's show as well as a small preview. Of yeah, we we could do that. We could do that. Sure. Uh, why don't we go ahead and get right off match number one. Again, SmackDown, or, uh, yeah, Smackdown actually started out with a uh, match. This has uh, seemed kind of, kind of a habit, James Walsh. It looks like our uh, kind of uh, bitching and complaining about them always cutting these odd promos has uh, actually paid off. You mean somebody's actually listening to us? Someone might actually be listening to us. We saw Booker T with Charmel taking on uh, Joey Mercury with Melina, Jillian, and Nitro in his corner. You know, a good match. Uh, Joey is always a pleasure to see working. We all remember him from uh, the ECW days. He's a phenomenal worker. Booker T obviously speaks for himself. Former and, uh, five-time, 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 five-time WCW champion. Indeed. Booker T obviously got the win on this one. Um, it's an interesting little feud here, you know, something I wouldn't have necessarily expected. Um, we got to touch really quick on this uh, Jillian Hall character with this growth on the side of her face. To me, this is like the epitome of corny, if I can use that word without being corny myself. The fact that she has this, like, kind of uh, plasticky with stuck-in hair, it, it doesn't even look real. And from what I understand, she's actually got some real talent. If it were me booking this, I would have put her on Raw when Trish Stratus comes back and had him go into a feud. Uh, you know, she's a good-looking lady. She can wrestle. I mean, th w what better way to, to use a female wrestler than actually watch her work? One of the things we discussed is that these girls don't seem to have gimmicks. And now this one has a gimmick, but it's one nobody likes. So we have to find a middle ground so it's a gimmick that people actually can get into and isn't absolutely absurd, yet is still in entertaining. Yeah, indeed. Why don't we move right on? Our next segment was The Peeps Show, which is, of course, uh, Christian's new version uh, of a talk show here on WWE SmackDown. Batista was the guest. Um... I don't know if we actually call this a, a kind of talk-style show that we witnessed here. It was more like a Christian just basically challenging Batista to a fight. 
I guess so. And what I don't understand is, once again, and we talked about this last week, during the segment backstage with Teddy Long, Rey Mysterio Jr. was named as Christian's opponent in the main event, and he looked legitimately afraid of a guy who stands all, four, all of three foot two inches tall. Then the next week he challenges Batista, this monster of a man, I don't get it. There's no continuity in it. That's what we're talking about. There's no continuity in what he is and is not afraid of. Right on. And uh, obviously this match was accepted by Batista. Batista's not backing out from anybody. Um, I, I can kind of see why they did this. When we get to the end of SmackDown, we'll, we'll touch on why they set this segment up a, a little bit more. But our second match of the evening was the Tag Team Champions, which was Animal and Heidenreich, who's now sporting a mohawk and face paint for all of you who have not watched SmackDown. They were uh, versing Scotty Sabre. And Jason Snevnik, if I pronounce that right. Speaking of squash matches, this was absolutely a squash match. And it was good, man. It, it served its purpose. Squash matches have a purpose. Not everything needs to be a pay-per-view quality match that's on television. And you know what? The crowd did not crap on it. The crowd actually cheered. The problem that I think the people have, or the writing team has, figuring out, is squash matches should be squash matches. If you're going to have a nobody out there, they can't actually get spots in because, number one, if they're a nobody, they're a danger to the other talent who's a star. And number two, if they're out there and they're a nobody, people are going to get bored of seeing them. So they just want to see the star go in there, beat the tar out of them, and that is the story. And it, it worked great, man. It seems like uh, Animal and Heidenreich are actually having a pretty successful tag team run. This led us into our next segment, which was uh, the arrival of Dominic with... Uh, Angie um, and Eddie and Ray and the uh, social worker, the whole nine yards. Um, th this went on for, for a little while. Uh, well, I think it might still be going on. <laughs> this is some kind of segment right here, man. This probably went a good 20 or so minutes um, with... Uh, it's like a, it's like a whenever Pink Floyd song just never ended. It, it did never end, um, but I, I understand why they did it. Um, this is kind of right now a SmackDown's bread and butter. Um, it's been a really, not a, a terrible feud by any stretch of the imagination. At least the WWE has gone in and put some quality time into this feud. Um, you know, really worked out some storyline material for it. That, that's obviously clear. But um, this segment just ran a little bit long. It, it was it was good. It, it did what it was supposed to do, which set up the stipulation for the match, which was, um, which was uh, obviously Dominic. Um, custody of Dominic, uh, the, the SummerSlam pay-per-view. Absolutely, and I heard a story that Dominic is a little freaked out by this story because he doesn't know if it's real or fake. So and poor Dominic. That, that is also a problem when you get someone uh, that age involved in these. Um, you know, we saw a couple times with uh, Sandman when we interviewed him mentioning how his kids were using his storyline. I don't know that I'm necessarily a big fan of this uh, idea, but it definitely makes for an interesting storyline nonetheless. Why don't we talk about the returning Randy Orton coming out uh, as well to uh, challenge the legend um, and, and also beat up Kamala. Well, he didn't beat Kamala. He just hit the RKO on him, and then he disappeared. I do like when Randy Orton and, uh, and uh, The Undertaker feud, how it goes from R I RKO to RIP. That is such a cool visual. It's always good to see The Undertaker do his more menacing, dark stuff. I personally would have rather him have been in attendance. I, I think as well you're correct in saying The Undertaker needs to be a part of the show a little bit more often in order for his feuds to really get built up solidly before a pay-per-view. This is one of the big top four um, pay-per-views for WWE. Obviously, you have you know King of the Ring, WrestleMania, SummerSlam, and Survivor Series. Um, to not have him there, I think, kind of hurts this and kind of shortchanges Randy Orton. Absolutely, but you know what? If you want to know, if you want to see The Undertaker, just tune into SmackDown tomorrow evening. He's going to actually be there. He's actually going to be there. I read the quote-unquote spoilers. I have not yet. But uh, let's go to match number three. It was the Mexicals versus Scotty Tuhati with William Regal. Um, you know, I, I still kind of like this Mexicals character. Um, the Mexicals obviously got the victory in this one. We're going to keep motoring right along here. We're kind of like a little uh, sports segment right here. We're just going to give you some results. Uh, we saw Chris Benoit take on uh, Simon Dean. Chris Benoit got the win. Um, I don't exactly know how, but in some way, shape, or form, this led to a match with Orlando Jordan for uh, the United States Championship at SummerSlam. I don't exactly see the parallel here. Well, didn't you know that otherwise Simon Dean would have been the number one contender, given his long list of victories? Uh, I, I didn't even see that as a stipulation. I don't know. Don't ask me why this match is taking place. I think it's just to even out the list between Raw matches and SmackDown matches, because if it was going to be based on what should happen... 
I think it would pretty much be 80% Raw and 20% SmackDown. All right, we're talk about the final match here of WWE's SmackDown event from last Thursday. It was the WWE World Heavyweight Champion, former guest here on the Wrestling Epicenter, Dave Batista, taking on uh, one of our personal favorites here is Christian. Um, you know, not a bad match. I'm always impressed with Batista. He seems to get better and better in the ring every single week that passes. Um, it was a good match. Obviously, we saw the interference from JBL toward the end of the match, which uh, led this to be a no contest. But I'll tell you what, Batista took some vile chair spots from JBL. It seems like it was a week of vile chair shots on uh, WWE programming. Absolutely, vile chair shots. It kind of mirrored what Mr. Batista did to JBL at the Great American Bash. And, of course, there's a rematch at SummerSlam. So that goes hand in hand and makes perfect sense. And uh, I'm looking forward to see the blow off to this feud. I believe this is going to be the last and final match. We're going to take another quick break here, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Wrestling Up Center. We're going to come back with our SummerSlam card and predictions. Make sure you keep it locked for here, or right here for that, excuse me. We also have Hulk Hogan, which is going to lead us out of this week's show. So make sure you keep it locked right here to the Wrestling Up Center, only on ASU's original alternative, The Blaze, 1260 AM. Hey, this is the Macho Man Randy Savage, and you're listening to the interactive interview. Oh, yeah. Enjoying what you're hearing? Be sure and check out WrestlingEpicenter.com on social media at Facebook.com slash Wrestling Epicenter. On Twitter at James Epicenter. And of course, WrestlingEpicenter.com for 24-hour news updates, our interview archives, and all the other information you've come to expect from the Wrestling Epicenter. The Blades, 1260, 1260 AM. I told you we'd take a quick break, man. We're back here on the wrestling episode on the Blaze 1260. And what a moment that was when Hollywood Hulk Hogan actually became Hollywood Hulk Hogan from, uh, you know, the Hulkster Hulkamania. I remember that just like it was yesterday. And, man, that was a sight to behold, watching Hulk Hogan show up on WCW television and basically completely disown the good guy persona to take on the, the Hollywood Hulk Hogan character that wreaked havoc in WCW for years and <laughs> more or less saved that company. More or less save that company is exactly right. The outsiders came in, but when Hulk Hogan turned heel, that put it over the top, and that really rifled the wrestling boom that took place over the next four years after 1996. We're going to get right in here to our SummerSlam predictions. we got Patrick on the phone. Patrick, it's a pleasure to have you with us this evening. Hey, what's up? How's everybody doing tonight? Uh, we're doing good, my man. Yo. I like to call this dude Patrickless from the, the movie Troy, like he's <laughs> Achilles' brother. And oh, your yeah. cousin, Patrickless. And of course, he is the host of our internet wrestling show. Indeed, he is. As well yeah. as Eric Clancy, who uh, has made several appearances on this program before. I'll but tell you what, man. I, I just want to take a quick second here to reflect, if I may. When we actually started this show, James and I, to, to think of our meager beginnings, if you will, as to where we are now. Yeah. We're interviewing Hulk Hogan. We got our boys doing a phenomenal internet show. You know, we're working with the Queen of Extreme Francine every week. Marty Jannetty's going crazy on the forums. You know, The Blaze is doing better. We got Amber O'Neill on the forum, Simply Luscious, Lanny Poffo. Just so many things going on, man, and we're only fitting to get bigger. And let me just announce this right here. We got another person that just joined the forums last night. We haven't even made the graphic for it yet. The one and only Lodi from the West Hollywood Blondes has now joined the forums. Oh, oh Patrick, Liss, how does that make you feel, buddy? It makes you feel good. I like Lodi. Absolutely. We got a lot of people joining up with the Wrestling Epicenter. If you're not with us, you're against us. All right. Now, here's what we're going to do, Patrick. Liss. We're going to go through our SummerSlam card. We're going to have James get his predictions. I'm going to give my predictions. Then we're going to ask for your predictions, all right? All right. So try and keep up with us. Here's, good. here's the SummerSlam card. Looks like the curtain jerker is going to be Orlando Jordan versus Chris Benoit, followed by Rey Mysterio versus Eddie Guerrero. We're going to have Eugene taking on Kurt Angle in the uh, gold medal match, I suppose, if you want to call it that. We'll have Batista taking on JBL, Matt Hardy versus Edge, John Cena versus Trish Jericho, Hulk Hogan versus Shawn Michaels. We're going to start off with James Walsh. Who do you see winning the Orlando Jordan Chris Benoit match? Can I make fun of you for just saying Trish Jericho? I said Chris. I think you said Trish. No, I, can I said Chris, brother. All right, well, maybe I'm just thinking about Trish Stratus a lot. My opinion on that match, I'm going to go ahead and say that Chris Benoit wins the belt simply because it would be an absolute dishonor to the Chris Benoit character for him to lose. Next match, match, we got Rey Mysterio taking on Eddie Guerrero. Who are you picking in that one? If it's going to be a ladder match, I go ahead and pick Eddie. All right, next match, Eugene versus Kurt Angle. Who do you pick winning that one? Kurt Angle's winning. And why do you think he's winning? 
because he's going to go in the world title feud with Cena. He's the next logical step. Okay, we got Undertaker versus Randy Orton. This one's a toughie to call. It could go a number of ways. Who do you see winning this one? I said the RKO gets it. You see the RKO getting it, huh? Oh, yes. You think he's going to get his return victory from uh, WrestleMania? He's returning the favor, the Undertaker is. Excellent. We got our Matt Hardy versus Edge match. Obviously, this has had, you know, overly exposed real-life implications. Who do you see going over on this one? Edge, because Matt Hardy's dead. Okay, we got Batista taking on JBL. Who are you going over there? Uh, Batista, I'll go with Batista. You even had to think about that? All right, man. We're going to go John Cena versus Chris Jericho. Uh, anybody that says Chris Jericho is an idiot. So you're going to say John Cena's getting the win? Yes, sir. Hulk Hogan versus Shawn Michaels. I'm very interested to hear Mr. Walsh's opinion. Is he is the epitome of a Hulk Hogan mark. I think Shawn Michaels is going to win, but it's not going to be a win that devalues Hogan or actually defeats him. It's going to be a repeat of the Survivor Series. All right, actually, Patrick, that's a lot. We're going to go with you next. Orlando Jordan versus Chris Benoit. Who do you see going over here? Um, Benoit is the safe bet. If Orlando Jordan wins, it'll be because JBL interferes and they'll set up a feud between those two. Oh, Benoit. that's some good booking right there. Good thinking, this man. See, Patrick, Chris is the man. you got to check out the Internet show. It airs uh, every Friday. We get it up on the site. Rey Mysterio versus Eddie Guerrero. Who do you see winning that one? <laughs> uh, surprisingly tough call, but I'm going to pick Eddie. Okay. I keep picking Eddie, and he always loses, but I think it's time. You think the, the, the change is in the future? Yeah. All right. Eugene versus Kurt Angle. Uh, Kurt Angle. Undertaker versus uh, Randy Orton. Randy Orton. Randy Orton going over to the Undertaker. Oh, yeah. Huh? So far, we're uh, pretty even on our results here, man. I, I think you and James are exactly on the same page. Matt Hardy versus Edge. Uh, I, I'm going to pick a no contest. A that's no kind contest. Of a to call, but I have a feeling that's going to go to a double DQ, and they'll have like a street fight. At the next pay-per-view or something. Fair enough. Batista versus JBL. Uh, Batista, but if JBL wins, it'll be because Brock Lesnar shows up. Ooh. I've already predicted that Brock Lesnar might show up. Well, there was actually an interesting story today on the net that uh, says he may, in fact, be showing up. If you uh, read an article that was just recently published in a uh, news publication, it says uh, in Brock Lesnar's upcoming appearance schedule, it says SummerSlam, August 21st, 2005. Just oh, wow. uh, an interesting uh, little sign. you got to check out the news board, my man. Yeah, I, 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 I read it. I just missed it, I guess. I, I read it just when I have... Yeah, I don't really read it. you got to go to <laughs> www.wrestlingatthecenter.com. Cheap pops, cheap pops. you got to check it out. Cheap John pops. Cena versus Chris Jericho. Oh, Jericho is going to win this one. Okay, yeah. well, then, uh, is, according to uh, Mr. Walsh... Get over here, I'm going to smack you. <laughs> <laughs> it's Cena. Okay, we got Hulk Hogan versus Shawn Michaels. Toughest call on the card, but I'm going to go with my gut and say Hogan. Okay. I don't know why, but I just have Now, who's going to ask me? Am I going to ask myself? Uh, Patrick, I think between you and I, we'll get the card down straight, okay? Okay. All right, Orlando Jordan or Chris Benoit? I'm going to go with Chris Benoit here. I think it's time to uh, do a title switch. Orlando Jordan hasn't done much with his run. It's time to give the belt back some credibility, so I'm going with Benoit. How about Eddie Guerrero against Rey Mysterio? i got to go with Eddie Guerrero on this one. He's lost three times in a row. Um, it would not be beneficial to Eddie Guerrero's character to have him lose again. Hmm. Patrick, you got the next one? Okay, uh, Kurt Angle versus Eugene, gold medal talent. I thought a lot about this one, but uh, as James Walsh said, it looks like Kurt Angle is the heir apparent to a feud with John Cena, so I say Kurt Angle's going to go over on this one. Right. How about John Cena against Chris Jericho? John Cena versus Chris Jericho. I mean, we already discussed Chris Jericho taking some time off. Obviously, the win's going to go to Cena set up PFC with Kurt Angle. All right, Matt Hardy versus Ed. I actually see Hardy going over on this one. Um, it, there was too much time, too much energy spent on bringing Matt Hardy back to the WWE. Um, I think they got to give him a rub, and this feud will continue. Okay. Logical thinking, but I don't think it'll happen. How about <laughs> Batista or JBL? I see definitely Batista going over on this one. Um, now that Patrick was mentions uh, Chris Benoit getting the title and JBL and him feuding, I think that could be an interesting undercard feud. I think it would be a good step for JBL. He would still be working with someone who's talented in Chris Benoit. Um, and, and Batista's going to go on and continue being the world heavyweight champion. He's over as hell. No reason to stop now. How about the main event of the evening, the immortal Hulk Hogan, coming up later on the show, or the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels? Uh, I actually picked this one to go to a no contest myself. I think there's going to be some kind of swerve at the end, but I think it's going to be a, a double DQ um, or, or something like that. Distinctly a possibility. You're missing a match, guys. Come on now. What match are we missing? Undertaker versus Randy Orton. Ooh. Oh, wow. We missed that one. That's a big one. Well, yeah. Hey, Chuck, if I may ask you a question, who do you think will be... Uh, winning Undertaker Randy Orton. That's not a mean. Well, Chuck, meeting. I'll tell you who I think is going to win. I'm going to have to go ahead and say Randy Orton's going to go over on this one simply because I think Randy Orton is, in fact, a feature of this business. Ran uh, the Undertaker's time is done, excuse me, and I believe he's going to start putting over the younger talent, and it's going to start right here with uh, 
the future of the business, Randy Orton. When you started answering that question, I thought you were doing a Lee Marshall impression. That nah, was not the oh, Lee wow. Marshall impression. Patrick, listen, we appreciate you calling in, buddy. We're okay, I'm actually going to gonna be at SummerSlam, so... Oh, I forgot about that. We're yeah. going to try and get some clips from you live and play them on uh, next week's show. Yeah. Oh, man, you're a lucky SOB, my friend. Yeah, hey, it'll be a great show. I'm going to enjoy it lots and lots. All right, Patrick, thanks for uh, calling in, and we'll talk to you uh, next week. Also, don't forget to check out Patrick Liss on the Internet Show alongside Eric Clancy. Patrick Liss, you have a good one, man. You too. All right, later. Later. Well, guys, it looks like we're getting to the point in time where we're going to get ready to run Hulk Hogan. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back, give you guys a little lead-in to this Hulk Hogan interview. So make sure you keep it locked right here. It's the moment you've all been waiting for. Hulk Hogan's coming up here after this commercial break, only on WrestlingEpicenter.com, or excuse me, Wrestling Epicenter, only on ASU's original alternative, The Blaze, 1260 AM. My mind's getting a little excited, getting the goosebumps waiting for Hogan, so make sure you keep it locked right here. Oh, yes. This is Vince Russo, and you're listening to the interactive interview. Well, if that's what you think, Vince Russo, the time is here. It's almost time to play the immortal Hulk Hogan on the wrestling epicenter. I can't tell you how that makes me feel. The hair is standing up on my arms. My heart is pounding in my chest. I can't wait for you guys to hear this interview. It is going to set the world on fire. We're going to have the internet going nuts with this one as well as the Blaze Airwaves. They're literally going to be on fire here this evening, courtesy of the Immortal Hulk Hogan. We spent a good 20 minutes with this guy. We talked about a wide variety of topics, and I'll tell you what, you'll hear James and I actually be a little shook in the beginning of this interview. It was difficult to actually compose ourselves and get ready to do this. When he came on the phone with that voice saying, yo, Chuck and James, I was like, man. Oh, yeah, this is a star, dude. This is a real star. This is going to get us some publicity. But let me say this. Hulk Hogan is the reason why I'm sitting in this chair behind this microphone right now. He is the first guy that ever I saw in a wrestling ring that made me want to watch professional wrestling. And I've dedicated most of my adult life to being a wrestling fan. Wow, man, that's, that's some big words. I'd like to finish up our show because James and I are going to be done. We're going to leave you with this interview. It's that powerful. We'd like to thank Francine. We'd like to thank Lance Storm. We'd like to thank all of you who listen to our show, all of the wonderful guests. We had Mike, Mike, Patroclus, um, uh, Brian, um, so many great guys that, that really you know, are, are true fans. Let's not forget the Dynamite Kid. Well, that was Mike. Two Mikes. Two Mikes. Dynamite Kid is Mike. Somebody gave us an effing mic. Anyway, there, there's just so many fans. We, we'd really like to thank you all, and we hope that we've uh, done you justice with this great Landstorm interview and, and bringing you guys Francie on a weekly basis. And uh, this interview that we got coming up right here, man, the, the one that's going to set the world afire, is Mr. Hulk Hogan. We thank you all for tuning in to our season premiere, if you will. We're always now going to be on Wednesday nights, 8.30 Arizona time. That's also going to be, uh, what, 11.30 Eastern Standard Time? 11.30 Eastern Standard Time until you guys fall back at the end of September. Once again, you can always check out a little bit more information about our home, The Blaze, 1260 AM at www.theblaze1260.com. You can always check out www.wrestlingepicenter.com for all things wrestling. And for Chuck D., it's your boy James Walsh. Are you almost ready, Chuck? I am, I'm feeling it, dude. Can you feel it? I think we're going to get ready to feel this right here, guys. It's going to be some Hulk Hogan. Hi, gang, this is Bean Gene Okerlund from World Wrestling Entertainment, reminding you, you're where it's at with the interactive interview, right here, online. Welcome back to the Wrestling Epicenter here on the Blaze, 1260 AM. Today we have far none our most prestigious interview ever. At this time, I'd like to welcome the face of professional, well, the face of professional wrestling, excuse me, to our show, Mr. Hulk Hogan. Hulk, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. What's up, guys? How's everything going, brothers? I'd also like to welcome you to the program. I've been a Hulkamaniac for 20 years. You're the reason I got involved in this business, and i got to tell you, it's an absolute honor and privilege to speak with you. Hey, man, thank you so much. I just uh, appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to do a little venting here. A little hey. venting? Oh, what's on your mind? Uh, not much, man. Just the time of day, kids, daughter's getting old enough to date, and I'm mad about it. <laughs> well, enough. speaking of getting a uh, year older, not to put you down or anything, but tomorrow's your birthday, so let me be the first to wish you a happy birthday. Oh, thanks, brother. 52, what you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. Could that be a new t-shirt? Yeah, I probably should. That wouldn't be that wouldn't be a bad idea. It might sell for a couple of days. 
<laughs> All right, well, of course, we've got to ask you about the biggest match in the history of professional wrestling, yourself against Andre. But we're going to give it a new spin instead of asking the same question that happened, you know, 18,000 times in every interview you've ever done. I'm just going to give you another uh, spin on it. You know, that match was pretty much a ground-based style. A lot of the guys in the business today are doing all these high-risk aerial moves, and quite frankly, they can't even draw half the crowd. So, you know, what is it so different about you, the way that you do things, that transcends what they do? Well, you know, I listen with my heart. I listen with my ears. And I really don't need to sit in the back and talk to someone about what we're going to do out there because there's no way you can call it right from the back seat. You have to be out there and listen to the fans first and then react on that. So it's kind of a, uh, a situation that it's instinct. And, you know, if I could drop kick and I could climb to the top of the cage and splash somebody from the top of the cage, believe me, I would pick the spot when it really meant something. And it's all about, you know, working hard out there and working smart. And, you know, I've proved that with a limited repertoire of moves and physicalities that, you know, you can really draw billions and billions of dollars. So can you imagine if somebody worked hard and worked smart that really had some athletic prowess out there and really could, you know, do the Rey Mysterio stuff and, and really, you know, think through it? It'd be crazy. Oh, don't sell yourself short, Hawk. We've seen a few no, matches. No, but, but, you know, I'm trying to be humble about this thing because... You know, I'm just waiting for somebody to get it. You know, I really am waiting for somebody to come along go, okay, this is what it's all about, and this is how it's done. And just don't overthink it, man. Just listen with your heart and your ears, and it'll all come to you. you know, We've seen you throw a few insecurities around in your day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a couple of crazies. But, you know, it's all good, man. It's, I think I just basically have been so loyal to this thing that, you know, there's so many misconceptions about me or so many pre-judgmental type, you know, character things people think about me. They really are blinded by the trees, you know. It's, and it goes way back to promoters wanting me to do a job. And, you know, Vern Gagne for three years told me never to go down to one knee, you know, and it put me in a spot where everybody said, well, he doesn't want to do a job, he can't work, he can't take bumps. And so the promoters are going, man, if you go off your feet, we're not going to make any money. You're the Hulk. So it's just, it's, it, you need to know the whole picture of this business. I mean, a lot of guys, you know, Say, well, Hulk, back at 52 years old, a lot of people don't know of my relationship with Vince McMahon, where when we used to be on the road 90 days, we'd wrestle 120 times in 90 days, and we'd never fly anywhere. We'd drive from Boston to New York to Tampa, back to Atlanta to Chicago. And there's a lot of stuff here, you know, that's underneath, you know, the history that really, you know, you know sticks its ugly head up today and makes me different than other people. The way I react, the way I think, sometimes I may not say nothing. There's a reason for it. I just, I just, I just don't do things. I plan things. So it's just, it's a different take on everything, man. Uh, another, uh, another good point is to what you're saying is, is how people view you. Um, you. You know, there's a lot of people out there that kind of try and run your name through the mud. Uh, an example that comes to mind would be like a Randy Savage that goes out and releases the whole CD about you. You know, how do you, as a person, um, you know, drop the strength to overcome all that and forge on and still keep everyone kind of in the palm of your hands as far as the fans are concerned. Well, in generalities, you know, thank God people are nipping at my heels and talking about me and jealous and, you know, you know, sometimes people celebrate my failures, you know, and it's just a weird take on things. You know, people sometimes, you know, are good people and sometimes are bad people. Randy Savage, for instance, told everybody for three years he was going to kick my butt. I ran into him in Orlando, walked right up to him, went to shake his hand. He wouldn't shake my hand. Didn't want to go outside. He just sat in the chair and he shook for 30 minutes like he was scared to death. I mean, I mean, that's got to tell you something about his character, you know. And it's just, it's a work, man. And, and he knew it was a work. So he could, I'm going to kick over his ass or I'm dating Hulk over his life. He could say whatever he wanted because he knew it was a work. I can't do nothing about it because if I hit him, he'll sue me for everything I got. So, you know, it's, that's his deal. I mean, that's what makes him happy. You know, he lives in misery, so that's his thing. It's not mine. And, you know, there's a lot of people that, like Meltzer, was a wrestling observer. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the greatest, you know, I guess he's the greatest judge of wrestling that's never drawn a dime. So, okay, let's value his opinion. You know, so, I mean, whatever, you know, it's, it's different. I mean, if I was going to listen to anybody, I'd listen to Hulk Hogan or Vince McMahon or, you know, maybe somebody that, you know, knew the business a little bit, but everybody's got a it's, it's an interesting business and I read the tabloids and some of these people that write about movie stars probably have never met them but they'll sure tell you every emotion and every word out of their mouth of course it's second third fourth and fifth hand but 
So it's just really cool to be involved in something that has so many people stirred up and, you know, on the cutting edge, whether it's good or bad, they all want to know what makes you tick, so it's pretty cool. Indeed. Well, let's take a step back and talk about a little bit about SummerSlam coming up in just a couple of weeks. You're stepping in the ring with Shawn Michaels. The question I have for you is, we just mentioned WrestleMania 3, 93,000 fans there. Does it still get to you? Does it still put butterflies in your stomach to step through that curtain and know you have to deliver and make people who paid their money, you know, make, make them happy that they paid their money? Yeah, it's a gut check, you know, because this business can be very, very tough and you can be only as good as your last match. You know, so if I go out there and fall on my face with Shawn Michaels and I, and I never had a chance to redeem myself, it could be that end to a you know, 25-year career. Yeah, and so I do get butterflies every time I go out. And, you know, with the thing of getting older and, you know, the knee replacement, the hip replacement, it really, really puts me in, in the checkmate position with myself because I try to rationalize, okay, I'm here, it's working. Do I need to do this? Why am I doing it? You hear the fans. You want to do it. It's, it's a back-and-forth tug-of-war all the time. You know, so it does give me butterflies for a, you know, a ton of reasons, business, emotional, physicality, getting out there, chasing the kid around that's half your age. It's, 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 a, it's a weird head trip, man, but it's like, a, like Hawk used to say, what a rush. How much adrenaline actually goes through your system at that point? Do you even feel any effects from, from the hip replacement, so to speak, with all that adrenaline, knowing that the fans are just totally in the palm of your hand? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel everything, brother. It's, it's not like I'm, you know, uh, you know, swimming from the tsunami for, you know, you know, the fight of my life. It's, I'm not there with it, you know. I've gotten to a point where I'm used to being out there, and more than anything, I'll breathe through, think through things. It's almost like being in a chess game out there where everybody's panicking and going, make a choice, make a choice, but you really have to wait to make the right choice. So it's really a mind game out there. You know, you can make your body breathe faster or slower. You can make yourself tired or not tired. It's it's really a huge mind game for me out there. And I, I pride myself on being a survivor out there with guys that can work, guys that can't work, guys that can talk, can't talk, small guys, big guys. It's, I've been able to adapt to Army. I mean, if you think of all the people I've wrestled, I've probably drawn more money with more different people than anybody else. I mean, you know. I know Stone Cold and The Rock had a run, and they would wrestle The Undertaker or Triple H on a real consistent basis. But for a while there, I was wrestling different people every night and drawing money with them. So it's, it's you know, I pride myself on the staying power. Well, speaking of reacting to the crowd and knowing what to do, you did something completely unexpected in 1996 when you pretty much went from being the family-friendly hulkster to being the more menacing Hollywood character. Um, let me ask you this. Did you have any reservations about doing it and how it might affect you long term? No, I, I think we're cool with that. I mean, it was something that needed to be done. The whole business, you know, after the WWE demise where I left, and well, I don't mean demise, after my WWE departure and uh, WCW run with the red and yellow when the numbers kind of leveled off, Bischoff said, man, what about being a heel? I said, man, it'd be heavy. We may never turned back from that point, so the train and prayers by them, hey, brother, I did it for the money. That whole attitude, kind of like the anti-establishment thing, just jumped on the bandwagon with Stone Cold, and we took it to a whole other level with the NWO, and it showed in the numbers that we stole most of the universe out there as far as the wrestling audience, and it was a, it could have been a wild ride that was still going if people didn't take their eye off the ball. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that, but... While you were part of the NWO, you called yourself the biggest icon in wrestling. And on the other show, the WWF at the time, WWE Now, Shawn Michaels started calling himself the icon. Uh, he started doing that again since he started feuding with you. Does it at all eat at your crawl that he's doing such a thing? No, not at all. I mean, it, it, it's a work, you know, and it's something that is good. And it, it's a great way to characterize yourself. But, you know, this thing is once again taking on a life of its own and you know, they have writers here now, which I really am starting to warm up to because even though I don't use them 100%, they always have something good to give you. And you can really use everything you can get sometimes. And all these writers, you know, Stephanie McMahon, even though I didn't realize that she's pretty much got her finger on the pulse here, and I'm, she's giving me nothing but good material. I twist it around, add stuff, take stuff away, but it always works. And with that being said, you know, the Shawn Michaels who has, you know, found the Lord and, has got at peace with himself, 
has those demons still in him because, you know, the other night in the ring, he kind of like took it upon himself to get real personal, go off the script, and I realized, you know what, this is a little different than anything I've been in before because the guy that really was trying to bury me and put me out the pasture still has that demon inside of him, and if I don't, you know, put that beast to rest, I don't think anybody will, so and maybe it's just with me, but whatever it is, he's crossed the line, so this is really going to be a different type of deal for me. Well, even going back a little bit more here on Raw just this past week, uh, you and Michaels probably had a segment that stole the entire show, bar none. Um, and you mentioned two words that used to be taboo in the WWE. Those were, of course, Bret Hart. Um, Bret Hart has you know, some harsh feelings toward the WWE. He feels he was, uh, quote-unquote, screwed. Um, you yourself had an interesting situation with Vince Russo over at Bash on the Beach in 2000. Um, he's recently been mentioning he mapped out the idea of uh, Jarrett laying down and then Russo himself cutting a promo on you later. How planned was this, or was it all legit? Well, you know, I can't really get into the details of this thing because I guess we're going to court over it. But, really? uh, you know, certain things we had talked about, but then Vince Russo took the liberties to totally change the whole battle plan. You know, otherwise, brother, I wouldn't be going to court, you know, right. if, if this was a work. You know, the, the final, 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 final end-of-the-day outcome, you know, of what was supposed to happen. You know, Russo can spin it any way he wants, but you know, I'd have to be a real stupid individual <laughs> to take somebody to court over a work. Right. You know, so you can put that in your pipe and smoke it. You know, you'd have to, you know, release a rap CD challenge you to a fight or something stupid like that. What's that? I said you'd have to be pretty stupid, like releasing a rap CD, you know, challenging you to a fight. I guess, man. I mean, you know, if, uh, the truth is, if it was a work like Vince Russo is trying to spin it around me now, we would be going to court over it. You know that. Yeah. Well, one thing we know is for real is uh, your reality show, Hogan Knows Best. We love seeing the real side of the Hulkster on TV. Now that the series has been proven to be such a, a success, might we be able to see a season two of Hogan Knows Best? Yeah, brother, they're uh, already on that. You know, they've already thrown it at us. It's been in the trade paper, so we're gearing up for round two as we speak. We right actually, I actually just got a couple weeks, and then we're back doing it again. Oh, excellent. With all the reality shows on television today, what in your mind has made Hogan Knows Best such a success, such a standout? I think we hit a nerve. I think we're back to the, the square one where, you know, what you see is what you get. You know, you got the Osborns over the top, rehab, drugs, kids out of control. And you got, you know, reality shows, going places you've never been, contests, winning money, be something that you're not. You know, Getting married on TV. <laughs> whatever, you know, do something you've never done, you know. And then they put, you know, nine or ten people out of house for six weeks. Of course, they're going to act up. They're only on TV for a short while. But, you know, they came into our place, and this is what we do, and this is how we act. And we're normal, but whatever dysfunctions we have are normal ones like, you know, homework and fighting with the wife and the kids acting up and, you know, just pressures of everyday life. So I think people kind of like were dialed into seeing a real reality show and also the wrestling stereotype of Hulk Hogan which everybody's just seen the ball-headed screaming, hey, brother, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Hulk Hogan to turn into Terry and go, hey, Nick, you know, come on, brother, turn the stereo down and do your homework. I mean, to see that, I guess, you know, and I really can't make a decision on this, but what I've heard, people are interested in just seeing me walk around with a bandana off or in my shorts or the stairs I walk down to my gym or the bed I sleep in and what my cars and my dogs look like, I guess, you know. I would have loved to seen, you know, uh, Marilyn Monroe's house and her dogs or John Wayne's stuff or, you know, I mean, I would love to see a lot of stars as, you know, movie stars or celebrities' homes just because I'm curious. So I think it's that curiosity factor of the wrestling fans and the loyalty of the fans and the built-in audience that kind of like, oh, my God, I've watched Hulk for so long, but now I can kind of like see what he's like the other 23 hours a day. Hmm. But I think we just hit a nerve, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me pose this question to you. You know, of course, of course you mentioned uh, several times in other interviews that you pretty much did the show to help springboard Brooke Hogan's music career. Right. And, of course, uh, Brooke Hogan has been mentioned a couple times on TV by some of the wrestlers. Any chance you might see her maybe escort you to the ring or anything in that in the future? Brother, you know, I'd, I'd love to say that will never happen because I've talked about it with her. And that would be my worst nightmare, and maybe it wouldn't be my worst nightmare, but the thing about my daughter getting beat up or hit in the head with a chair, I just can't even comprehend that, or it does not compute. Yeah, yeah. But in this world we live in, I guess we're going to have to never say never, so not, Can that, you that's no, not that that's an open invitation to, you know, for Brooklyn crawling around her underwear in the ring, but 
mean, Jesus, dude, I, I have no idea what lies ahead. Can you give us a, an update on how her music career is, is going at this point in time? Has she, uh, you know, got, got uh, signed yet? Um, no, no, she hasn't. I mean, I, I thought it was going really good until about 10 minutes before I talked to you guys. Uh oh. And then I got the crazy call from my wife in L.A. So, you know, it, it, it's every five minutes it changes. You know, I think I'm on track with the right people. And, and all of a sudden, an A&R guy will change his mind, or somebody from the company will decide to put it off. So it's been like four and a half, five years, or maybe even more of, you know, first off, she had to go to boot camp and get up to speed, but she's ready to move forward, and, you know, we're at that sticking point. I just don't know the business well enough, and I just haven't broke through that click, you know, and I haven't gone from evangelist preacher to, you know, greatest manager like, you know, Simpson's old man has, but. I'm trying. Uh, I, I gotta be honest with you. I think you do have a pretty good pulse on it. Uh, on a recent episode of Hogan Knows Best, uh, you, you didn't really have it out with a, a producer, but you definitely put him in check. Uh, I, I think your quote was, "I'm the one that brought us all to the bank." <laughs> well, that that may have been out of character for me because that sounds like an ego statement. But I probably did say something like that. I was so upset with the the flim flam job of them wanting to dye her hair black and cut it short under her ears. I just couldn't let that happen. Uh, I don't blame you either. She's got a good look, and I think we all have a definite positive outlook for her in the future. I definitely got to believe she'll make it, and there's a market for her out there. I pray to God she gets where she wants to be. Hopefully it will be the music business, because that was her first choice. Yeah, and she's actually a talented singer, and another thing that I really like about her is she actually you know, plays keyboard really well, and she sounds really good. Yeah, and she's a good person, man. You know, At the end of the day, and I don't mean to just say this about her because she's my daughter, but she's really a good human being, and I... I told her, I said, anybody that works this hard for so long and is this relentless, something good has to happen for you. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, you know, she'll get that break. And we wish you uh, all nothing but the best. We appreciate your time, Mr. Hogan. It's been an honor to have you on the show. Hey, bro, and, uh, thank you guys for uh, the hey. opportunity, man. This has been really nice of you. Hey, it's, it's our pleasure. So it's good luck with your match at SummerSlam, which is going to be August 21st against Shawn Michaels. And also don't forget to check out Hogan Knows Best on BH1 every Sunday night. We look forward to seeing uh, season number two. And also this week, we look forward to seeing uh, you and your wife get a nice vacation while uh, Brian Knobs babysits the kids.